Good. So in our previous lecture, we have presented the perception, which is the basic unit when building deep neural networks or neural networks which are not deep anyway. In that perception, we observe that there are some parameters, some weights and biases that need to be estimated and that will define how the perception is going to uh, behave. In order to estimate these parameters, we're going to run a process called backpropagation, which is actually the training process uh, for the for for when training the unit when estimating these parameters. There are also other options for training, but backpropagation is by far the most adopted nowadays. So let's start with the election. So I'll start sharing the slides as usual. First, my acknowledgments to Kay McGuinness from Dublin City University and Alisa Seidol from UPC. Also, you have here Alisa Seidol lecture on backpropagation. Before presenting backpropagation, I need to introduce a concept that you will see in more detail in the future, which is the concept of loss function. The loss function assesses the performance of our model by comparing its predictions, that's going to be y with a hat, to an expected value, y, which is typically coming from annotations. That would be the ground truth value. For example, imagine that predicted price y with the hat of our model and the one that we actually paid, like y, that would be the ground truth. These two values, like the predicted one and the actually paid, could be compared with the Euclidean distance that you might heard of it as the L2 distance or the mean square error or MSC. So if we have, for example, a linear uh, regression, we'll be solving this equation, right? And now if we want to, to compare the, predi the predictive values with the ground truth, actually there should be a hat here, sorry, um, we could be using the L2 loss. That what it does is like for each of the components of the vector y, it's going to do a subtraction at the power of two and then add all the values and an average by n, like where n is the dimension of, of the vector. Okay, notice that if you um, plot the curve of, of this loss, like what, what, what is going to be the value uh, with respect to the, to the error, this is the kind of shape that you will get when you get a, an Euclidean loss. Okay, so there are many other losses uh, when training the neural networks, but for now to move forward, into the explanation and I need to introduce that. So the loss function kind of is going to guide the training process so that when we update our parameters, our double use and bias here, I will try to uh, minimize the total error. That's going to be to minimize our loss function. In particular, let's assume a very, very, very super simple um, system, which is like even less than a linear regression. So actually imagine that we want to minimize a loss function, LW, and we only have one parameter to estimate this, W, okay? And we use a L2 loss function. We may have like our, our parameter would give us like for a certain um, value, right? This loss function. So th this loss value. So, so just imagine that we, we want to that I would say train our uh, linear regression with only one parameter and we start with something, some random value, okay? We fit one of our training samples, one of our pairs X and Y's. We make a prediction, Y with a hat, okay? And this prediction, as we can compare it with the ground truth, we can compute a loss value, okay? And here this curve, what it's telling you is that if your, if your loss function is an L2 loss, like depending on the value of the parameter you're trying to estimate, uh, this is how your loss will evolve because it's a squared law. It follows a square law because there's this square here. It follows a quadratic form, okay? Then um, when we are doing training, when we are training deep neural networks or neural networks in general, uh, what we are going to do, it's, it's to follow an iterative process. So imagine that that's it, right? We start our training process, we initialize W at this value, this is why it states W at T, at time step T, 
okay? And give us this uh, value, this error of the loss, okay? Based on this graph that you see here on screen, uh, if you are going to update W, so if you are going to update um, W, the weight, what would you do? Would you increase it or decrease it? You please answer on, on the chat. Like if, if these are, at, at, if what we are looking is that uh, a screenshot of, of the loss at time step T in an iterative process, which we're going to be iteratively estimating W, and you are here, and we have a value that WT that gives you this, this loss function. What would you do now? Would you uh, increase it or decrease it? Okay, so the answer that I see the, on the chat is decrease, and that's correct because notice that this W, okay, it's mapped here. This the the, the all this is all the range of possible values that W can take. Okay, so different values will result in different losses, and this is what we are plotting here. Okay, and based on what based on what you are seeing, you see, hey, uh, I see that the minimum loss is over here. So what I would need to do is to decrease. I would need to go to, into that direction. Okay. What it's very important here that you know is that uh, while this is very nice because I'm, I just plot you here the loss and you can all see that the minimum is here, this is not the case when we train neural networks. We don't know where the minimum is, okay? So we, we, we don't see this very nice blue curve that, that I plot you here. We don't, we don't, we don't see the, the, the actual shape. Uh, but we'll need to, to, to take decisions about how to update the parameters during training. Then if you don't see the minimum, but you see something just over here in the neighborhood of WT, um, which operation could tell you uh, which way to go to the left or to the right in this example of the operations that you know from calculus? If you, if you, if you can look here around. The derivative, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so the derivative um, will tell you like, in which direction um, this function is kind of increasing or decreasing. And the direction, in this case, it's a loss. As we want to decrease the loss, if we compute the derivative, it's gonna give us like uh, some value which is going to be positive in the direction. So we, we want to do is to go against the direction of the derivative, okay? And the answer is like, now I can, I can, I can know with the slope, let's say with the derivative, I can know more or less in which direction to update my parameter for the next iteration, like the next question is how much, right? How, how, how large should the step be? So this, what you probably already know as the gradient descent algorithm, which is basically telling you when I have my parameter WG and I want to update it at the next time step, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the derivative is what you have here of the loss function with respect to the parameter I want to estimate, W, at the point where I am now, WG. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to go against the, the derivative. This is why we have a minus here. So we're going to go into the direction of the, of the derivative. And there's still another parameter that I didn't comment, which is this alpha. This alpha is what we call the learning rate. The learning rate is what we call a hyperparameter. It means that it's a value that you will need to define, set yourself when you train your deep neural networks. And it's normally one of the challenges when you train neural networks to uh, choose the right learning rate. And in addition, uh, often to change it, like through the training process, through the optimization process, typically change it to try to, that our parameters uh, can find a combination that decreases the loss. So the, the lower the loss, the better the predictions of our model will be, okay? And remember, our curve will not be as nice as this one, okay? And in addition, we will not have uh, one parameter W. We're going to have millions of parameters. Each of these W, it's each of these weights of the perceptron that I showed you earlier, the weights and the, and the, and the bias, and you're going to have uh, thousands of neurons. So that's going to explode into millions of these double weights. And each of them, you need to update it following, uh, if you want, this approach. There are, again, there are other optimization techniques, but we are going to focus on this one, which is the most popular. 
okay? So this is what we want to do. We want to apply something called the gradient descent. And here the trick or the challenge is basically, I told you that the learning rate is a hyperparameter. We set it and maybe we change it. But the challenge in general is just to find derivative of the loss with respect to each of the parameters of our model, of our all the weights in the perception. Or when we have a network, all the weights in our network. That's going to be the, the big challenge. And that's what most of the computation, most of the GPUs are computing when training deep neural networks. OK, so back propagation, which is the topic that we are discussing, will allow us to compute the gradients of the loss function with respect to all the model's parameters, OK, which is what we want to to uh, estimate also with respect to the intermediate data. Normally, that's not very interesting. And that's something that normally we say that, that the gradients will flow from the output of the model where we compute the loss backwards. Because uh, you, the, you, have a, you see a network that it's where the gradient will be changing, updating the parameters. And actually, that's why uh, some years ago in this conference, the NIPS conference, uh, Intel, where when they presented one of, the, of their uh, latest chips, they actually brought a flow rider, which is a very famous wrapper, OK? Because it's flow rider because they was kind of a joke of, of the, the part was called let the gradients flow, OK? That's where, where they presented a new uh, chip for deep learning. OK, let's try to understand how can we estimate parameters if uh, in a new network. We'll focus in a simple case first, which is just the perception, OK? In order to estimate the backpropagation, understand how it works, we'll need to understand which are the operations that, that are implied when we are uh, computing the output of a perception. So here you have a perception with a sigmoid activation, two inputs uh, with the two uh, parameters, a bias, and this is the, uh, the range of output values, OK? So let's see, what is the computation graph, which means like which operations are executed executed in which order of a perception when, if it has a sigmoid activation. So the concept of computational graph, it's very useful to understand uh, how the neural networks are trained and, and how backpropagation works. This is, how, this is the, what the computation graph uh, looks like. So we're going to draw a graph that shows the order in which of, the, of the operations. So remember, the perception, the first thing that you do is uh, you compute the the product of the weights with the input this is a product, the two pairs of products. We add them. We add the bias. And here, finally, we compute the sigmoid activation to the input. Okay. What you see in this screen is the computational graph of a perception. Now we have this example. Let's imagine one simple example in which I set values to the input weights and the input data. So these are the input weights and the bias. I set some arbitrary numbers, some arbitrary numbers to the input uh, data. And if you follow the computational graph, what I'm, what I'm uh, drawing at each point, it's the results of all the operations. So you see here, if you follow in detail, that at the output of this computational graph, we have a result of 0, 073, whatever this, this value means, OK? When we go from the input values to the output of the network, we talk about the forward pass of the computation. Our challenge here, remember, is that we want to compute the gradient of the loss with respect to each of the parameters of our, uh, in this case, of our perception. So here our parameters are W1, we have it here, W2, and the bias, and, we, and what we would like to know is uh, what is the partial derivative of the loss for each of these parameters? Because it's not obvious because W is here and the loss is here, and there are like so many intermediate steps, and this is what we need to solve. In order to solve that, we are going to apply something you already know about, which is called the chain rule, which is uh, the derivative of the of, of nested functions. So in this example, you have a nested function or one, two, three, four nested functions, which kind of says like, if I have an input data uh, x1, I have one, two, three, and four nested functions. This computational graph, which is kind of very simple, you have it decomposed here below with uh, 
classic notation. I'm just defining the names of the, of the intermediate variables at the forward pass. Okay, now, what does the chain rule tell us? So the chain rule tells us is that if we want to find the partial derivative of the output with respect to the input, what we need to do, so this is what we want to find. So what, how, so the question is like, how does a varia variation, a difference on the input affect the prediction? How does a variation of X1 affect the output uh, Y with a hat? So the chain rule tells us that what we need to do is to compute the partial derivative and uh, do the product out of them. Let's try to analyze in a bit more detail, how, how to compute this, how, what does it mean? So let's take it from step by step. Let's look first at the, the very end. So uh, let's uh, consider that we call this delta five to the partial derivative of y with a hat with x5, which is, which is exactly the same. So in this case, the partial derivative is, is just one. So which on other, other words, it means that a variation in x5 directly affects on y with a hat with a one-to-one -one factor. Let's take one step backwards. Now things become more interesting here, right? So the question now is, if we want to compute delta four, we want to know like, how does a variation on X four affect the predicted Y with a hat? And now it's when we apply the chain rule because it's telling us that this is the variation of Y with a hat with respect to, the, with respect to X five multiplied by the variation of uh, X with a X five with respect to uh, x4. This first term is what we call delta five. And this new term, that's what uh, you, we can like reformulate that. So the, the, the variation of x5 with respect to x4, to, yeah, to x4, that, that is the partial derivative, or the derivative of g4 evaluated on x4. This is what it's telling us. It's telling us just compute the derivative of G4 of this function and evaluate it on X4, okay? And that's a trick. You will just keep doing that. We'll just keep uh, computing the derivative of these functions and eva assessing them, evaluating them on the, the point that it's provided as the input. If we just deploy, all this uh, algorithm, like iteratively, it's always the same. At the end, we'll be able to compute the partial derivative of um, y with a hat with respect to x1, which was, remember, that was our first goal. Okay, just notice that this is always the same. It's always just uh, trying, the goal, uh, the challenge will be always knowing what the partial derivative is and assessing it at the uh, point of operation. Let's put that in, into practice uh, now. Um, yeah, see, I'm just repeating the same. So the steps will be always be do. We need to find the derivative of the functions, evaluate it at the at the x input, and then multiply it with the back propagated gradients. That in this scheme, it's are the deltas. Okay, so it, we will be doing back propagating the gradients and modifying it by the value of the derivative at the point of operation. Notice, and it's important that while I was doing all this explanation with y with a hat, in our case, so this will be in general, the chain rule, which maybe you have uh, learned about it. In our case, in which what we want to do is to know how the parameters of our model uh, affect the loss function because we want to decrease it. We want to minimize the loss function, okay? So when training neural networks, we will actually compute the derivative over the loss function, not over the predictive value y with a hat. Okay, let's take this concept, this idea, to the, our exercise, which was computing the gradients for the perception. So remember that what we need to do is to know the partial derivative of the operations in the computational graph, and so that when we know the partial derivative, we can assess them in the point of operations. In this computational graph, you have, we have three types of operations. The sigmoid, we have a sigmoid over here. A sum, we have two sums over here. And products, we have two products over here. So the first thing we need to do 
is to know what's the value of the derivative of these uh, three functions. So let's compute them. Actually, the first point here is like, uh, so I'll do the propagation. The, the first one is like, the first point is like the, 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 the gradient, let's see, of the output with respect to itself. So there will be a one that we're going to inject here. And let's start now with the sigmoid. So the sigmoid, uh, here you have a long uh, calculation. I will not follow it now in detail. You can look at it later uh, on your own. But here, the, the, what it's nice is that there's a closed form for the partial derivative of the sigmoid. And that's actually one of the reasons why we're using the sigmoid, because it's, it's, uh, it's something that we can an analytically solve. And this is the form of the partial derivative. Okay, actually the sigmoid has its shape, and if you plot the derivative of the sigmoid, uh, you will have uh, this nice uh, shape over here. And as you can see, the derivative is almost zero at the, at the tails, which is something we already discussed, and the maximum derivative is at the central point, which is almost uh, linear. Okay, so we already have one. Now let's put that into practice. Remember that what we need to do is we need to assess the derivative of the sigmoid, which is uh, this function, at the point of operation. The point of operation is provided by this one, okay? The, the, it's what it's called this dot. So we go at the um, forward computational graph. It's telling us we are going to look at the partial, uh, derivative of the sigmoid and assess it at one. So here what I do is, I uh, implement the sigmoid in F. Uh, here below, you have the formulation of the derivative form. And finally, uh, as I put the dot already here, uh, when I assess it, I get this value, 0 0.19. This 0 0.19 is what I plot here on, on red, okay? Also, um, maybe I should also mention that actually it's the partial so the, the derivative with respect to x multiplied by the gradient, the gradient that was coming from this side, which is one. So actually it's, it is 0.2 uh, per one, okay, or, or this 0.2 uh, multiplied by one. That's why it, it stays with 0 0.2. And now we have already the partial derivative at this point. Let's move backward. Now we have the additions. In the additions, we can also compute the partial derivative. So when we have uh, an addition of two values, and we uh, compute the partial derivative for each of the two terms, the partial derivative is one. Okay, so that's quite easy. When we have an addition, we take the compute, take the gradient and multiply it by one. Okay, remember that what you're doing is always take the gradient and multiply it by the value of the derivative at this point. When we have a, a sum, uh, and a, uh, the derivative, it's, it's always once, so multiply, 0 0.2 multiplied by one, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 multiplied by one, 0 0.2 here, and 0 0.2 over here. It stays the same. Next operation is the multiplication. Here you have, on the left, um, the formulation to compute the partial derivative. When you have a product between two variables and we have a partial derivative uh, with respect to i, the, re the result is b and the opposite. So this is a bit tricky. Let's, that sometimes it poses some confusion. So let's, let's see if I, we do it well. Um, here what we have is the gradient. So let's, I'm looking at this node. The gradient is 0 0.2. That's what comes from here, 0 0.2. Let's look at the gradient that should result from this uh, branch, okay? I must take the 0 0.2 and multiply it, okay? If I take in this branch, that will be a branch of the minus one, what it's telling me, so at, in the, this note, it's multiplying, let's say minus one per two, minus one per two, okay? So if this is a branch of the minus one, what the formula is telling me is that I should look at the input that comes from the other branch, and that's a partial derivative. So that would be the, the two will be the result of this formula. 
And remember that always what we need to do is multiply the partial derivative by the gradient. So I'm, I'm having the two multiplied by the 0 0.2. And this is why I have a, a gradient of 0 0.4. And if we do the opposite, it's going to work as well. You have the 0 0.2 and multiply by the minus 1. This is the gradient that, that goes through this other branch. OK? So you can later, if you want, take a look at the rest of, of branches. But I'm pretty confident that everything is, pretty, is well computed. So what's the interest of this result? So we, we are done now. We just already reached the input. And we managed to compute what we wanted. Now we want, like, what's the partiality of the output with respect with W1, W2, and B. These are the parameters of the model. And remember that this is what we want, because based on this partial derivative, now we'll be able to update this, uh, the values of, of these weights or these bias in an iterative way. And we can adjust its estimation. And iteratively, hopefully, uh, by, by adjusting it and re-estimating, decrease the total loss if we do it well. Okay, So these are the parameters that we learn for, for our models. Notice, yeah. Notice, though, that we could also, even it seems useless at this point, we could also compute the partial derivative with respect to our input data, with respect to x1 and x2. We already have them, these values over here. At this point, for today, they are totally useless. But you will see that in some cases, when you try to understand what's going on, going on in a neural network, this might be useful. But for today, it's something we can compute, but we are not interested. I'm leaving you here a couple more of, uh, let's say, gradient weights uh, for operations that which are common for the max. If you have, at some point, some max operation in your computational graph, what you need to do is to root the gradient only to the, to the higher input branch, OK? So you just discard, don't, don't, don't propagate gradient on the lower branch. So in this case, if the input is 2, and one, and you have a max operator here. Of course, the output is two. And if you have a gradient, say 0 0.2, that goes through uh, through this uh, node in the computational graph, it will just propagate it into this direction. And it sets to 0 on this other direction. In the other hand, if uh, you have a split branch that somehow um, your data was uh, split, so it's kind of uh, just was split in, in two branches. If you have if you build networks that have this kind of topology, what you need to do is to just add the gradients. So the gradients that come from this direction and this other correction, just add them and they will go through. So th these are not in the perception, but it might be useful in the future. Another important um, gradient that actually earlier I mentioned that it's interesting, it's the ReLU. So for the ReLU, uh, remember, it was one of these rectified, uh, means rectified nonlinear, rectified linear unit that uh, it's often used, especially in deep neural networks, as, a, uh, as an activation function. Most of, most of, most of the neural, net neural networks, they are using this activation function. I notice because it has two advantages. So first, in the forward pass, it's quite easy to compute the result, because if the input is negative, the output, uh, sorry, the input is negative, the output is zero. If the input is positive, you just uh, copy, let's say, the, the input data to the next layer. But if you're do it, doing back propagation, so in the backward pass, what you will have is that uh, if your gradient is positive, you just multiply it by one, so just let it go. But if the gradient is negative, you just kill it. You just uh, delete the the negative uh, gradients. So actually, it's, it's a, the step function is the, is the derivative of the rel. And this is super quick, fast to compute, and it has very good optimization properties. And that's why it's, it has been a, a very important key player in deep neural networks. So if you want to learn more about backpropagation and partial derivative, I suggest that first you watch this lecture from MIT, and later there's this more advanced lecture on Yoshio Benjamin talk about backpropagation.
and also like even here you have like some more uh, readings that present or this topic in more detail uh, and also like a more philosophical question always as, as useful as usual if, if you want to click on them you can read all the the whole advanced discussions then I'll just leave you this this problem uh, for you to think about and we'll discuss the solution next week uh, it's nothing that it's going to be graded but I suggest that you solve it um, if you have questions I'll, I'll put it in a as an assignment on, on the classroom but if you have questions just feel free to, to ask me but basically it's just a, an exercise in, quite similar to the one that we just completed on the perception to compute the back, back propagation problem so this will be the end of this uh, session. Um, if you have any question, please let me know. Um, 